ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world. Happy holidays. We're going to continue to dig into all the most serious issues before you take that holiday break and continue to bring you guests that are important, inspiring, and iconic. And this is a guest that I am very happy to finally have on this show, a man I've known for a long time, a man who's had me on his show many times and I think is one of the most important voices in the national conversation, especially right now. The great and powerful Tavis Smiley finally joins us on Independent Americans. Welcome, my friend. I am honored to be on Independent Americans, Paul. It's a, it's a great honor to be with you, sir. Thank you. It's a really cool thing to have you as a guest on my show <laughs> because I've been a guest. I've been a guest on your show many times, many different formats. Uh, and, and it really is cool to be able to have a conversation with you um, in, a, in a different way. So thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I joined your show a couple of weeks ago and mm -hmm. there's a lot going on. I want to talk media. I want to talk mm -hmm. politics. I want to talk about the future and race and Trump and all of it. Um, but let's ground in, in a conversation in a, in a question that I ask of all of our guests. Where are you and how are you? I am well. I am in Los Angeles, the city of angels. And uh, uh, although not so much of late, I'm sure you've been seeing in the national news that uh, these smash and grabs and and these murders, obviously a big national news story of late, the, the wife of the powerful music music executive, Clarence Avon, uh, his wife's name is Jackie Avon, 81 year old woman uh, killed in the middle of the night in their home in a very exclusive part of the city called Truesdale Estates. So there's a lot to, to reckon with. Uh, as you know, across the country, a number of progressive DAs have been elected in San Francisco, in New York, in LA and beyond. And so now we're starting to see a pushback. I don't wanna get in front of you, but we're starting to see a pushback on some of these progressive DAs around the country. Uh, George Gascon here in LA is facing a recall after just being elected a year or so ago in San Francisco, Chase Abudin is facing a recall and people are pushing back on these progressive DAs rightly or wrongly uh, Paul, because the crime rate is starting to skyrocket. And some people argue that because these progressive DAs are, you know, making it clear that they're not going to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law certain crimes, people are just run amok. And it really has become sort of the wild, wild west. So it is the city of angels again, also, although not so much these days, but I'm in LA, uh, number one, where I've been for 30 years, I guess, uh, since college. And uh, I'm doing well. This pandemic, of course, has challenged all of us in myriad ways. But if I complained to Paul Reichoff, I would be an ingrate. So I'm just grateful for that. For, I'm grateful for every day, man. Uh, well, but I, I appreciate that. And mm -hmm. I'm grateful that you've always given me a voice and given so many voices to activists in particular. And, you know, this is independent Americans. I want to talk about the political dynamics and the partisan divide. But you're touching on something that's important because, you know, I, I live in New York. We got Eric mm -hmm. Adams coming in after right. Bill de Blasio. But Eric Adams is an ex-cop. He's coming in as a Democrat, but kind of sounding a little bit like a Republican, like he's going to clean mm -hmm. things up. It almost sounds like Giuliani, you know, mm -hmm. 4.0. Right. And, mm -hmm. and there's this there's this dynamic happening where people are afraid that L.A. is going to become this stereotype of San Francisco or, or Portland. Right. This the city on fire. But you mm -hmm. mentioned something that I think I want to pull apart, which is progressive. You started now KBLA. I want to get into that and in, in this new phase for you as an entrepreneur and a new media company. But you call your, your effort a progressive station and you use the word progressive progressive seems to be defined differently by a lot of people how do you define progressive it's a great question uh and for me it's simply this progressive to me paul means that you want and you live a life and try to leave a legacy that speaks to this reality and the reality is simply this that you want the same thing for everybody else's kids that you want for your own kids it's just that simple we live in a world uh and certainly in a society that is uh, terribly divisive right now, politically, economically, that the, the gap between the have gots and the have nots continues to grow. I don't think that's sustainable. I think at some point you end up in a place of anarchy. I'm not calling for anarchy, but I think that poverty is a threat, not just to our democracy, but it's a threat to our national security because this growing gap cannot continue uh, uh, to exist. And so I think that <clears throat> in many respects, we see this country uh, divided politically, economically, socially, culturally, and we could talk about that to the extent you want to. But for me, being a progressive means what I just said, that you want the same thing for everybody else's child that you want for your child. But it's not just an ideology. It's not just an idea. 
you have to engage a work and a witness. You have to uh, assign yourself to do the kind of labor that has to be done to create the kind of America that we want, an America that will one day be as good as its promise. I think that's all we want, independent, left, right. We all want to live in a nation that will one day, we ain't there yet, a nation that will one day, Paul, be as good as its promise. The problem with our nation right now is that there's a huge gap, a huge divide, a gulf between the promise of America and the possibility in America for all of our citizens. And I think that's got to be the goal for all of us, to make our nation one day a nation that will be as good as its promise. For me, being a progressive means, again, um, advancing an agenda um, that uh, ultimately tries to get us to a place where every child in this country uh, may not end up at the same place, but they all start at the same place. We could talk about that in terms of access to an equal high quality education, access to an environment they can actually live in, access to health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what it means to me to be a progressive, wanting and working, not just wanting, but working uh, toward an agenda, toward an America that will guarantee that every child in this country has access to the same kinds of opportunities that you would want for your own child. I've been I've been looking forward to having this part of the conversation, Tavis, because I don't think it happens enough, especially out in the media. Like I started Righteous for independence, for people who are mm-hmm. unaffiliated, for people who don't have a media network, who feel like they're left out, they're politically homeless. You can be, mm-hmm. you know, a, a Democrat or Republican. If you're not a diehard partisan, you're welcome here too. And I want to build that over time. You're building KBLA around a progressive. Uh, philosophy, progressive values. So let me ask you two parts of that, if I can. You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to perpetuate too many tribes, but I definitely don't want two tribes. And right now we only got two options, right? You got Democrats and Republicans in most areas. Can you be progressive and not be a Democrat, right? I think when mm-hmm. people hear progressive, they think Bernie Sanders or they mm-hmm. think AOC, but that may not be what people see themselves as. So who, who is, who are the, the spirit animals, if you will, or the movement yeah. leaders of how you define progressive? Obviously, you're one of them, but beyond you. Um, and, and what does that look like? Does it have to be a, can you be a Republican and be a progressive? So, you know, where does that sit on the spectrum? And, and who are, in your view, the, the best leaders that represent those values? Yeah. So it's a very good question, which is why I'm happy to, <laughs> to be in dialogue with you. You always make me think. You always challenge me, Paul, um, to re-examine the assumptions I hold. You always help me to expand my inventory of ideas. And so I'm grateful always to be in dialogue with you, my, my, my dear friend and brother. A uh, powerful question. Let me, let me answer it in a couple of ways if I can. Number one, it's not so much, I think, about individuals for me as much as it is about an ideology. Uh, put another way, I think in this country so often we get wed to a particular ideology that we look right past good ideas. So I take the heart of your question about whether one has to be a Democrat just because one is progressive. In reality, I've got some major issues, uh, all uppercase, M-A-J-O-R, major issues with the Democratic Party, in part because it is not as progressive as I think it ought to be, number one. Number two, for me, being a progressive ultimately means being a truth teller. I believe that my role is to seek the truth, to speak the truth, to stand on the truth, and to do my best to stay with the truth. And I recognize that uh, I don't have a monopoly on the truth. I I also recognize that there is is the truth, Paul, and there is the way to the truth. And because I've arrived at a particular truth that others might not have arrived at as yet, doesn't mean that I have a monopoly on the truth, doesn't mean I'm always right. Um, It does mean, however, that my job is to try to seek and to speak and to stand on the truth. Sometimes that means making people uncomfortable. It means Uh, not as Donald Trump and and Kellyanne Conway and others would suggest. It does not mean that there there isn't a a set of alternative facts. I think that's a bunch of poppycock and nonsense. But I do think that we have to uh, do our best to tell the truth. We have to be able to say, have the courage to say what it is that we see. And that's how I see my role as a progressive. Certainly as a person of color, uh, that means sometimes advancing a narrative and trying to raise questions and and, and, and to, to ask questions and to, to address topics and to profile people who otherwise would be left out of the conversation. So for me, it's not so much about a, an individual, about an ideology or about certain ideas, but it's about uh, trying to advance a conversation about the truth that so many of us want to put our heads in the sand about, number one, writ large. Number two, I, I always, how can I put this? 
I, I always, let me back up. I regard Dr. King, Paul, this is just my own assessment. I can debate you on FDR. I can debate you on uh, Abraham Lincoln. But to my mind, Dr. King, as in Martin Luther King Jr., is the greatest American this country has ever produced. That's my own assessment. The greatest American this country has produced. And King had a unique lens, a unique way of seeing the world, seeing America, certainly. And it's what he called the triple threat facing our democracy. What is that triple threat? Racism, militarism, and poverty. As a progressive, that is how I see the world. That is the lens through which I try to engage my work and witness. What are we doing on militarism? What are we doing on racism? What are we doing on poverty? Those are the three greatest threats. And these days we can certainly add climate change and global warming to that list. But for me and for the balance of my career, those are the three issues um, that are at the epicenter of the ways in which I try to engage, again, my work and my witness as a progressive. If that, hope that answers your question to some. Yeah, I, I, th this is a conversation I want to have because I think that that, that, that helps um, define where progressives, as you define them, where KBLA, mm -hmm. where Tavis Smiley sit on this wow. spectrum. Because in my view, like it or not, people are looking to the media for leadership. And in many ways, the leadership that might have come from activism in the past. Many modern day activists are media figures, right? Mm -hmm. In the same mm -hmm. way, Dr. King was able to, 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 to master so many different communications formats. I mean, if Dr. King was around right now, I mean, maybe he'd be a podcaster. I don't know mm -hmm. how he would yeah. bring his <laughs> message to the people, but there would be a disruptive uh, component to that. So people are looking for voices, right? And mm -hmm. when you hear progressive, you might think Bernie Sanders, but a lot of people think MSNBC. Mm -hmm. And they think Chris Hayes, they think Rachel Maddow. Um, and there's a disruption happening now, but also a calcification where Tucker Carlson and, and Sean Hannity are considered the almost the thought leaders, right? And on behalf of many uh, Republicans, or, and certainly right-wing Republicans, right? And then similarly, Rachel Maddow, Chris Hayes, we can go down the list, are, are considered the thought leaders, if you will, um, for, for many on the left. For me as an independent, when I hear those values, those are things I support, right? Those three things are things I support. I think many Republicans would support them. So I'm trying to continue to find that common ground, but also kind of blow up the status quo a little bit, which is what I think you're trying to do, or, or maybe you will do um, by launching KBLA. So as we look at this landscape, right? MSNBC is gonna have a change. You got Brian Williams gonna rotate out. I would be very surprised if they replace him with a white man, right? Mm -hmm. Rachel Maddow is gonna rotate out. I don't know, maybe Nicole Wallace is next in line there. Um, over on CNN, Chris Cuomo's out. Now there's a big debate about who fills that space. Um, Fox is kind of crystallized and getting more and more isolated. But now there are these alternatives. I'm one of them. You're one of them. Joe Rogan's one of them. Ben Shapiro's one of them. Can you talk about how you see the media landscape, um, yeah. not just as a progressive, but also as an entrepreneur, which yeah. I'm sure will lead you to explaining why did you start Okay, okay, why'd you buy a radio station in Los Angeles? Why are you doing this as your next move? Yeah. So first of all, let me say this. Uh, with all due respect to those persons you mentioned who are uh, most often viewed as being on the left, the Nicole Wallace's, the Rachel Maddow's, the Chris Cuomo's, the Chris Hayes, um, the list you just mentioned. And let me, let me just say respectfully, I'm not so sure I see any of those persons as true progressives. Um, at best, what we get from those persons, I say this with all due respect, at best, what we get from them, I think more often than not, are democratic talking points. Uh, I'm not so sure that I would put any of them in the true progressive category. And I'm not saying that to demean or in any way to cast aspersion on them. I'm just not sure that they are in the vein of the kind of progressivism that I'm talking about. I don't think they critique this country through the lens of militarism and racism and poverty in the way that I do, or frankly, in the way that Dr. King would. Um, so let me just say that, number one. Number two, with regard to the way the media landscape is changing more, more expressly to your to your question, I think that ultimately what we're witnessing, uh, Paul, are persons like yourself who I would call not traditional mainline journalists. Um, as a matter of fact, for the balance of my career, I've never allowed folk to call me a journalist. I have nothing against journalists or journalism. It's quite necessary in this country, obviously. Um, but I've said to people, if you're going to call me a journalist, then call me an advocacy journalist. In the tradition of Ida B. Wells Barnett or Frederick Douglass or Monroe Trotter, I could run the list uh, uh, yeah. for, 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 for eons here if I had the time. 
but I, I say an advocacy journalist because I'm not going to lie about the fact that I have a position. I'm trying again to speak the truth that I think ult that ultimately is oftentimes left out of our conversation, left off the table. And as you, you've heard before, if you're not at the table, you're likely on the menu, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to I'm trying to raise issues and speak the truth that often isn't heard when people gather around the table. When I'm on Meet the Press or this week or Face the Nation, I'm deliberately and unapologetically trying to bring a viewpoint to that table that I think is typically left out of the conversation on the Sunday morning talk shows or beyond. Having said that, I think what we're witnessing with regard to media is the rise of what I would call citizen journalism. And I th that's the kind of category that I see you in, citizen journalism. You don't have to be connected necessarily to a major network or to a major newspaper or anything major. Um, you, you, you set up shop and you have a point of view and you're trying to bring in voices that are left out of the conversation, people who have been politically and socially and culturally and economically disenfranchised, that's the way I see your work. So if I were, I don't want to box you in, but if I were to put you in a category, I'd put you in the category of being a citizen journalist. And we've seen a lot of that over the last couple of years, Paul, particularly in this season of racial reckoning, where there are everyday people who've trained their camera lens, trained their phones, um, not just on George Floyd, but on so many other incidents, we see citizen journalists bring to us stories that otherwise wouldn't be told. Again, raising questions that otherwise wouldn't be put on the agenda. So I think what we're witnessing in the months and years to come, in part uh, due to the advent of social media, are the rise of citizen journalists. And I welcome those voices in the conversation alongside the traditional mainstream sort of a uh, media voices that we've gotten yeah. accustomed to hearing. Can I, pa can I pause you there for a second? Because I think I, I want to expand the aperture a little bit too, sure. because I think most folks don't know, you know, Amy Goodman's out there, right? Has right, been sure. out there for a long time. For mm -hmm. some people, it's almost like public access, right? right. But she gets, she gets numbers. She's been out there. She has a very dedicated <laughs> following. There, there are folks like the Young Turks, right? There are people mm -hmm. that are probably more more, more in line with a progressive uh, ideology, right? Mm -hmm. But but they they're still um, kind of kind of not swept up into this national conversation. You don't see Amy Goodman on Meet the Press, right? And That's right. it's and 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 the no shit too is it's mostly white people, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 terrestrial radio, local uh, networks, and local radio, um, and other places have been kind of, in my view almost the, the where the action is right I, I consider myself an advocate right this is an extension mm -hmm. of my advocacy i'm telling stories i'm mm -hmm. trying to hold people accountable and maybe i'm more like you know an old pamphleteer you know before the, you know when the printing press came out right like i'm handing out pamphlets and trying to spread ideas and also organizing right mm -hmm. that's a key part of this so for me this is where modern activism is. This is where modern organizing is. This is where, in many ways, thought leadership is. And you're a guy who's worked with, you know, everybody from Cornell West ac across the board. So when you when you think about that, um, how how, do, how does the power increase from a business standpoint, right? You're, mm -hmm. I want to go back to KBLA, right? There's still a lot of people listening to, to radio in their car. There's still a lot of people listening to radio at, at work. When people come to my podcast, they often tell me, I'm the first podcast they've ever had, right? right? So I'm bringing them off terrestrial radio or they're coming from somewhere else and coming into this new world. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about your strategy for this for this new effort and the voices you're raising up, which are different than the voices we're hearing anywhere else? Yeah. So first of all, thank you. Um, yeah, we're trying to do something different here with KBLA Talk 1580, um, which is to, again, amplify voices that have been left out of the conversation. So for example, in LA and frankly in this country, the, 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 the percentage of ownership of media outlets by people of color, specifically African-Americans, is minuscule. In LA, for example, there are almost 200 radio stations. And for 30 plus years or better, the only station that's black owned in a city that is as multicultural, multiracial, and multi-ethnic as LA Paul. The only black owned station in this city for years is a station called KJLH, which is owned by my dear friend Stevie Wonder, the brilliant entertainer. Right. Um, so Stevie's owned that station for you know three decades. But outside of Stevie Wonder, and that's a music station, by the way, KBLA then becomes the first Black-owned and Black-operated uh, talk station. So make that you know the first uh, talk station owned by a person of color, period, west of the Mississippi. I mean, imagine that. In a country this multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, we are the first station owned and operated by people of color west of the Mississippi, certainly by an African-American. And so that's significant because I think that one of the ways in which we 
advance this country uh, and, and, and come out of this season of racial reckoning having done something is to amplify the voices of people who are left out. As you you know so well, Paul, Dr. King, who I referenced earlier, famously said that a riot is the language of the unheard. Well, something is wrong if, for the, if, if, if the only way that people of color, if progressives can be heard, is for them to riot. That, that can't be the solution. That equation uh, doesn't work. As they, as they say down south, that dog just won't hunt, right? right so we right. gotta figure out a better way than rioting for people of color and for those who are disenfranchised um, to, to, to have their voices amplified. So that's what we're trying to do, number one. Number two, we're trying to bring voices to the table that otherwise wouldn't be heard. So the people that we're putting on the air every day are voices that I think need to be reckoned with, but they might not be the, the, the names of everyday people that you know, but they have a lot to say. Number three, uh, to answer your question again more expressly, I don't think it's a question of either or, but both and. That is to say, we're trying to take advantage, Paul, of terrestrial radio. At the same time, we also want to take advantage of social media, uh, vis-a-vis podcasting so that everything that we do on the air every day, the minute that I come off the air with my three hour show every day, each of those three hours within a matter of hours is uploaded as a podcast. So every radio show that I do, every conversation I have, you know, from nine to noon every day, within a matter of hours, there are three podcasts that are put out um, from the content of those conversations. So again, I don't think it's a matter of either or, I think it's a matter of both and. I think there's a way to embrace old line media or terrestrial radio as it were and at the same time not be left out of giving people podcasts mm-hmm. so you, so they can listen not not just at the appointed time not just in real time but listen in their at their own leisure so that's again i think it's a matter of doing both yeah. and that's what we're trying to do here and ultimately you know we refer to kbla as our as our flagship station i don't want to get ahead of myself or you know, you know my ambitions to uh to, to get the most of me but at the end of the day, you know me. I'm not a one-off guy. I believe in building things just like you believe right. in building things. Right. And so the goal for me is ultimately to use this as a flagship station, but if God be my helper, to build a Black Talk Radio network. And I think the timing couldn't be more propitious for that. So it's not just a, a just one station in L.A. I would like to build a Black Talk Radio network across the country, a progressive talk radio network across the country. Many people remember Air America years ago, mm. speaking of Rachel Maddow and Al Franken. And perhaps that thing was ahead of its time. But one of the other problems it had was it didn't really include people of color. And I think now there's a different way to do it. And that's yep. ultimately yep. what we're trying to do, Paul. I, this is the conversation that I don't think folks are, are, are tracking on enough because this is, especially right now with the, ri- the re-rise of Trump and the division right. that's happening, the action in the media is in a different place. It's not just, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes less than 1 million people watching CNN and you got 20 million people downloading Joe Rogan. So the Mm -hmm. landscape is changing and I don't know if everyone understands it. I've come up in activism and in the media for almost 20 years now and I've done every show in America. I mean, almost. and And I found that for the most part, white people didn't know about folks like Roland Martin. I missed mm-hmm. Roland Martin earlier, right? Bev Smith. I remember going on Bev Smith's show over <laughs> and over again, right? Because she cared about veterans issues and she understood that that was a part of the community that, that listen, Tom Joyner, so many others. Now you got mm-hmm. Charlemagne, right? And, and there is this other ecosystem that most, in my view of white America doesn't hear and isn't tracking on. Um, and, and you have often been the only black guy I meet the press, right? You've often been the only black guy on a panel. You've, you've been able to crack in sometimes. Um, and that, in my view, has been really important and, and pivotal. This is happening when we had the Ozzy implosion, right? Mm-hmm. Carlos Watson is out there. He was saying, I think many of the people heard many of the same things that you're saying in a different package. He was a guy that didn't seem to be such a bomb thrower. He raised a shitload of money and it, it has imploded. So can you talk mm-hmm. about that landscape? Uh, yeah. I mean, frankly, you've been the only guy out there for most of white America for a yeah. long time. There are a couple other 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 exceptions. Right. But for the most part, um, it, it's been you. Um, yeah. So talk about that from a business mm-hmm. standpoint where Carlos sure. Watson raises all this money and, and a lot of other folks are grinding every day and the money doesn't seem to be matching the impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful question. And let me just say, I, I know Carlos Watson personally. I've known him for years, for decades. And that was a real tragedy. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, But let let me just say um, here that the thing that, excuse me, Paul, one of the things that I found so disturbing about the Carlos Watson situation, um, somebody said to me years ago um, that uh, when and where 
I enter, and this is true of all black people, when and where we enter, the whole race enters with us. It ain't just, it ain't right, it ain't fair. But when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me. That's just a fancy way of saying that, you know, if you get an opportunity, you need to represent. Don't act a fool. Don't embarrass us. Don't humiliate us. Do the best you can with what you have, wherever you are. But recognize that the opportunity you have will either open the door for somebody else who looks like you or will foreclose opportunities for somebody else who looks like you. And in that regard, uh, the Carlos Watson implosion of OZ was a major, major disappointment um, because they didn't do it the right way. And the lying and the cheating, the allegations, I should say, of lying and cheating and all that really is a black eye, pardon the pun, a black eye to all these people of color uh, and others like yourself who were trying to do it the right way. And it just, it, it cast dispersion on all of us. And there was so much money to your point that was raised. Um, and most of us don't have the wherewithal to do that. And so here comes Carlos. He has the right connections, the wherewithal to do it. And then it turns out to be a ruse. It turns out to be a hoax, right? And then all the rest of us get painted, certainly people of color get painted with that broad brush. So I was, you know, to say the least disappointed. I've talked to so many people, so many colleagues and people I know who felt the same way. And I, I know people who've written op-ed pieces in major publications, people of color, trying to make it clear to the rest of white America who has the money that can help shore up these ventures that we're all trying to launch, that we're not all Carlos Watsons. And again, I'm not trying to demonize or cast aspersion on him, but the truth is what it is. And all of us, again, have been harmed, I think, and maimed. Uh, and that's the real tragedy. Carlos didn't just hurt himself, he hurt a whole lot of us. Uh, and that's, that's tragic. Uh, now, having said that, it doesn't absolve any of us of the responsibility we have. We can't abrogate our responsibility to keep fighting. I believe that when we fight, we win. So we got to move forward, never mind what happened to him. Uh, but it's it's a tragic situation. And I just hope it doesn't do irreparable damage or harm to those of us like yourself, like me and others who are trying to go about doing it, uh, Paul, the right way. I I, th I think it's, it's it's an important case study. I mean, the guy raised three hundred million dollars or something, yeah. like that, right? And in contrast, yeah. at least what's publicly reported, you bought KBLA for under two million bucks, right? Yeah. Like I'm running this whole operation in my garage. I mean, you know, my kid's big wheel is over here, and I'm scraping it together all the time. And but but our situation is very different. You you know your your role is unique and important, um, and and difficult. Um, but it's also happening in a moment where. Um, you know, there are these really important communities across the country that are going to dictate tone. Mm -hmm. And Trump has had the negative tone. I've called him President Mayhem. He's destructive. He's mean. He's nasty. And that's permeated everything. And then if you go back to Dr. King, right, you've got the, the, the polar opposite in mm -hmm. churches, um, on the streets and organizing. So what I want to ask you is, is kind of a tough question. We just had the Rittenberg case. We had uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, I think we have an insurrection that is, that is now developed into an insurgency. I think we have an American insurgency in this country, and I think it's upon everybody, but especially white people in the media, to call it what it is, to call it extremism and racism and white nationalism and the enemy of the future of America. But how do we, um, as people who want to promote peace, who want to invoke the spirit and values of Dr. King, uh, we're, we're pretty close to you know open fighting in the streets. Yeah. Um, you got, you know, white nationalists marching on, on the Lincoln Memorial. And at, at how long do we expect everybody, but especially black people, not to fight? I mean, it's a hard question, but I don't know how else to say it. But but Trump is Trump wants a war. There are people in the streets who want a war. How many times can we expect people to have a fight picked and have them not fight back? I don't want to perpetuate violence in any way, but I'm looking yeah. to you to ask, how do we how do we find a way forward and peaceful way forward when it's looking like it's probably going to be pretty violent. Yeah. Um, let me answer it this way. Um, and this may not be the answer you're looking for, but let me just answer it anyway, the best way I can. Um, since you mentioned Dr. King, I'm going to give you the, the answer that King would give or he here, not because, you know, um, I'm anywhere near on King's level, but because I've studied him so much as you know, and wrote a book about him called death of yep. King. So I'm a student of Dr. King. If King was sitting in this chair right now, Paul, I think part of his answer to you would certainly be what he said consistently throughout his life. Un, excuse me, unarmed truth and unconditional love. There's your answer. Unarmed truth and unconditional love. 
somebody has to be willing to say the truth that they see. If you see it, you have to have the courage to say it. And that's where so many of us fall down. It's not that you don't see, Paul, the same thing that I see. It's not that many fellow citizens don't see the same thing that you and I see. It's that most of us, when we see it, we don't have the courage to say it. So we have to engage a response of unarmed truth, number one. Number two, unconditional love. You know, we could have an entire conversation. We could have done another hour just on this one a question that I want to raise now. We could do a seminar about this. I certainly could. And that is this question that I want to put on your mind and the minds of your viewers. Whatever happened to the notion of love in our public discourse? Whatever happened to the notion, Paul, of love in our public discourse? And let me unpack what I mean by love. When you say the word love, people think you're talking about something syrupy and something soft. No. Mm -hmm. Dr. King made it very clear that love is the most powerful force in the world. It is the only force capable of turning an enemy into a friend. Uh, I said earlier that I regard Dr. King as the greatest American this country has ever produced. Why do I feel that way? Glad you asked, Paul. I feel that way in part because look at all that King accomplished and the only weapon that he used was love. So I submit to you that something has happened to the notion of our putting love in the center of the public square. That's what Dr. King did. What Bobby Kennedy did was put love at the center of the public square. What Nelson Mandela did and all those in South Africa who didn't do to the white folk what the white folk had done to them, but they set up a TRC, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, and put love and truth at the center of the public square around the globe. I could do this all day if we had the time. Yep, yep, the yep. societies that have that have that have done the best, the societies that have that have climbed the, the steepest hills and have made the most progress are societies where people were unafraid to put the notion of love at the epicenter of the public square. What do I mean when I say love? Exactly what I suggested earlier. Love means that everybody is worthy just because. Not because of your color, not because of your economic income, not because of where you were born, not because of where you went to school, not because of the kind of car you drive or the neighborhood you live in. Everybody is somebody's child everybody is somebody's kid and all of us come into the world worthy just because i don't need any other descriptions i don't need any other just because you live and you breathe you are equally as worthy as every other fellow citizen can you imagine paul what would happen if we ever took that definition of love put it back in the center of the public square as we debated health care and poverty and education yep. Yep. and environment. Yep. Yep. I could do yep. this again all day long. If we ever yep. could take that yep. notion of love and put it back in the public square, it would fundamentally change the way we have these debates about public policy issues. And I think ultimately, again, make America one day a nation that would truly be as good as its promise. I'm just going to let that sit because that needs to sit for a second, right? Like that, that, that is very, very important and very focused and actually puts a point on it, especially as we think about the holidays and we think about the challenge. Mm -hmm. you, this is very, very important. I just want to reiterate, like I, I, what you're saying is the truth and it's right and it's powerful, but it's also rare, right? Like I, I look for like who embodies love on the national political stage. You don't see too many people. Like I think about Michelle Obama. OK, like my kids are watching her new show, Waffles and Mochi, all the time. She's talking about I talk about Mr. Rogers. We look for political leaders to show the love. And that's not what Biden's doing. Biden's showing empathy and even like a, a sense of connectiveness and, and he's an, an ability to understand pain. But it's different than love. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what we're looking for are those voices that can express the love. And, and for us, you know, I think about the national security community. That's the highest form of love you could ever show is the uh -huh. sacrifice of giving your life. And just before That's we right. went to record, there was the breaking news that, that Alan Cash is going to be um, awarded the Medal of Honor, I think, on December 16th. It just came out in the last you know, couple of hours. Um, he will be the first black Medal of Honor recipient in decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is stunning in and of itself. This has been ridiculously hard to get him the recognition that he's deserved. Um, there will be a ceremony in, in Washington, and that will be important. But I think 
what I'm getting at here, Tavis, is I'm looking for those leaders. And, and, and what I want to encourage people to think is outside of politics. They're not in politics. They are there sometimes. My friend Wes Moore in, in, mm-hmm. in Baltimore that I think you probably had on your show or talked yeah. to, I think he represents that very special kind of energy that is about love and his family represents that. But it's really rare. And, and I'm wondering if you see any leaders outside the political spectrum that embody that love. Who can we look to? Right. Yeah. When the national when the, when the national mall gets gets surrounded by white nationalists in hoods, who's going to be on the front line that not just on the front lines that we can see, but that we can trust and that yeah. aren't po- politicians. Who are those next generation of leaders that are going to be out in front with love? It's it's a it's a well worn refrain. Uh, and I apologize for it in advance, but it's 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 what comes to mind, Paul. And it's simply what what Gandhi said, that we are the leaders that we're looking for. Right. We are the persons that we're looking for. And so I I encourage people not to look to others, but to assign yourself, to assign yourself to be that which you want to see in the world. Uh, We have to be creative in how we imagine the kind of world um, that we want to live in. And I think part of the problem, Paul, um, and you used the word empathy a moment ago, and you put your finger out on the pulse as you so often do. I think the problem with so many of our leaders and so many fellow citizens, quite frankly, is that we don't make a, a, a real distinction between empathy and sympathy. We live in a society where people are happy to give you their sympathy. Um, but empathy is that you know something far different. Empathy means putting yourself in the shoes of the other, where sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody and, 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 and patting them on the head like they're a dog or some sort of animal mm-hmm. uh, or pitying them. People don't need your pity. They don't need your sympathy. They need your empathy. And when you put yourself in their shoes empathetically, then you see the world in a different in a different way through a different prism. It's the same conversation that I have all the time about the distinction and the difference between equity and equality. We are very good as a nation about having you know, conversations, even though sometimes they're pseudo conversations. Even then, they're not totally legit and not totally earnest. But we will nibble around the edges of a conversation, Paul, about equality. But nobody wants to have a conversation about equity. And so, we, you know, again, you, as you know, you know, doing this podcast and doing it so well, independent Americans, um, you, you don't get the right answers unless you ask the right questions. And if you're constantly focused on sympathy and not empathy, consistently focused on equality, but never get around to having a conversation about equity, if you're consistently looking for others to lead rather than assigning yourself uh, to create the kind of world you want to live in, I think we all we all miss the boat. And I, I never want to miss an opportunity to say to everyday people that at some point we have to decide what kind of nation we truly we truly want to be. That's the fundamental question that we're facing right now in our society. Who are we really? Uh, not not the ideals, the I D E A L S that we profess, but what about the ideas, the sometimes insane ideas that we latch onto? Um, so so who are we really? What kind of nation do we really truly want to be? In many ways, America has grown older, but we've not grown wiser. And I think fundamentally, we got to have a conversation about who we are really, what kind of nation do we really want to be? Those are the kinds of questions I think that are being raised by this season of racial reckoning that the country has been enduring, Paul. Mm. I, th- this is the conversation I want to continue in the days and weeks to come. I hope you can stick around for a couple minutes afterward for a rapid fire for our Patreon members mm-hmm. who are those activists who are helping us keep the lights on. I want to get to some rapid fire stuff with them. But before I do, let me just ask you may- maybe a final question. Sure. Um, you've brought you brought us into the world of Tavis Smiley and, and, and you are in this place of thought leadership that I think is very important. It's thought leadership. It's different. Right. You're pushing ideas and you're also organizing, which is something the world that I come from um, in social movement theory and social movement background and being, you know, in the streets and in the White House, uptown, downtown, everything in between. And that's what I saw that's different about what you're doing here in a media model. It's not just Tavis Smiley. It's a bunch of other people Mm -hmm. that are also being amplified for a movement effect. As you do that, if someone never heard KBLA, never heard Tavis, and they're living in this moment, they're worried about the future, what do you think is one thing they need to hear? What do they need to hear above all else in this moment that you think should resonate? Mm. It's a powerful exit question, Paul. Let me um, let me offer this, because this is how I see the moment that we're in. Um, I have never seen myself as an optimist. 
there is a distinct difference between optimism and hope. Optimism suggests that there is a particular set of facts, circumstances, conditions, something that you can see, feel, or touch that gives you reason to believe that things are going to get better. And when you can see, feel, or touch that, you say, oh, okay, I'm optimistic about X, Y, or Z. I don't think that's the world we're living in these days. The evidence mm -hmm. doesn't seem to suggest that there are many things that we should be optimistic about. I saw a poll, a survey not long ago, Paul, that suggested that for the first time ever, so many Americans who are being, uh, uh, being asked this question now believe that America's best days are behind it. And that really doesn't surprise me, given all that we're enduring and witnessing and evidencing these days, particularly in the midst of a pandemic like this. And people are just vulnerable and they're concerned and they're, some, of, some of us are being frozen by the fears that we have about our very future. And so the evidence right now might not be so readily available that suggests to us that there is a reason to be optimistic about our future. And I understand that because again, I am not an optimist and never have been. You can't be black in this country and never be an optimist. And Rosa Parks mm -hmm. was an optimist. Dr. King was not an optimist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass and, and, and Du Bois, these were not optimists. What were they? They were eternally prisoners of hope. And that's why I make this distinction between optimism and hope. Uh, I happen to believe, I happen to be a believer. And one of my favorite Bible verses, Paul, not to proselytize, uh, talks about hope. The Bible says about faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And even if you happen not to be a, a, a believer in that way, you can be atheist or agnostic. It doesn't matter. You take the point that faith, hope is the substance of things uh, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where there's no reason necessarily to be optimistic, but as Americans, we have to always remain hopeful. And if you see nothing else in front of you right now on the screen, Paul, what you see is a proud American who has built his entire life on hope. So often that's all I've had is a hope and a belief that if I work hard, a hope and a belief if I keep speaking truth to power, a hope and a belief that I keep if I keep challenging America, to live up to her truest ideals and her better angels, a hope and a belief that if I continue to use the platforms I've been blessed to have to try to get fellow citizens to re-examine the assumptions they hold, to expand their inventory of ideas, to see the world through a prison that's different than the one they've been trained to see or to look through, as long as I keep doing those things, there's always the hope, not the optimism, but the hope. Um, that we can do better. And so I am not an optimist, but I, I close by saying to you, my friend, that I am eternally a prisoner of hope. And so I, I just say to your audience that if you don't have reason to believe right now, if you don't see evidence in your own life, in your own personal space, no matter how dark things may be for you right now, no matter what it is you're going through right now, you might not be optimistic about your future, but always remain a prisoner of hope. Never surrender your agency to be outraged Never surrender the capacity and the ability you have to believe that every day you wake up is another chance to try to get it right. So just hold on to hope mm. when there's nothing else to hold on to. Now, the, the, the Black National Anthem, Paul, as you know, is a great song called Lift Every Voice and yep. Sing. And there's a verse in that song that says essentially that Black folk, that people in my community had hope when hope unborn had died. I mean, think about that. When hope got to my mm. people, it was stillborn. And even though hope was stillborn when it arrived um, on my doorstep, my people have always found a way to hope against hope. And I believe that at our best, Black people, uh, this American Negro, at our best, we've learned to love this country in spite of, not because of. And at our best, we've shown people that as long as you hold on to hope, uh, there are always, I think, brighter days ahead for our country. I hope that makes sense to you, to you, mm -hmm. Paul, and to your, to your viewers on some level. It makes a lot of sense on a very deep level. And, and I share that hope. Um, you know, we're all in this, in this trench fight together right now. Mm -hmm. We're all in, in, in deep in it right now. And, and we have to share that hope. I say it on the show all the time. Hope is, is the fuel of democracy. Mm. And, and I think what I want to do is be a partner with you in that always. And also 
uh, remembering that the vigilance is also required. And, and you've mm-hmm. shown me that and you've done that throughout your career. And, and we're going to try to make that as contagious as possible, too, because the hope is is necessary and the vigilance is required. Um, and so is the teamwork. And we're all in this together. And I'm, I'm grateful for your, your friendship and, and your teamwork in making this country and this world a better place. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. And I'm grateful for you sharing this message, especially right now. People need to hear it right now, um, especially going into the holidays. And and the hopes what get you through the fight. Oh, yeah. And, and we got to fight. We fought already. We're tired, but we got to fight more. And the worst days might be ahead. And, yeah. and the hope is what's going to get you through to the better days. So you've brought that hope. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm excited to continue the conversations and, and to get, hopefully get out to L.A. and see you at KBLA soon because it's cold as hell out here and I'm ready to go. Um, so uh, I, I thank you for your leadership and, and for your words, especially right now, my friend. Uh, and I wish you all the best for a happy holidays and hope you can stay vigilant. Paul, when we fight, we win. So let's keep fighting and uh, just know, my friend, that I love you, my brother, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. I, you know, I, you beat me to it. I was going to say I love you, too. I love yeah. you, too. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. All right.